My name is John Prydish and I'm the founder of Success Partners. And we're here today to, to talk about the Success Partners best practice series. And specifically today, our initial topic, which is sales and operations planning. Really, this is a how to get started guide for mid-sized companies. So really quickly, um, I've introduced myself briefly. I'm the president and CEO of Success Partners, 30 plus years of ERP implementations and sales many hundreds of projects, but ultimately a passion for helping our clients improve their best practices with ERP technology. I'm joined today by Hugo. Hugo, please introduce yourself. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here. I appreciate, John, the opportunity to share some, some insights with, with your customers. Uh, I was born in Chile over the last 20 years, half of my time uh, living in different countries. I had the opportunity to live in Mexico and other countries in Latin America and now uh, in Canada. So uh, primarily, I'm a supply chain person. Uh, I started my career as a, an operation analyst um, back in the day. And uh, my last uh, full-time employment position was as a VP of planning and procurement in a large manufacturing company in the West Coast of, of Canada. Uh, currently, uh, I, I provide advice in supply chain, um, in sales and operations, sales and operations planning. I provide uh, advice in, in supply chain data analytics, and I'm the CEO of uh, and co-founder of the Owl Solutions, uh, which is a supply chain data analytics company based in, in Waterloo, uh, Canada. Thank you, Hugo. So many of our clients are, are challenged uh, by sales and operations planning. Today, we, we're really here to demystify it a little bit and offer an opportunity to really help, un, help, un, help you understand how you might take advantage of this proven practice. So really, this 60 minutes will be, be beneficial if you wanna learn more about a core business process implemented by leading companies. Clearly, that would be a definition of a best practice. If you are looking for ways to improve your business performance, you know how do we make sure that we're generating leads and we're actually seeing those through to fruition and, and deliverable, profitable results. You want to get started with SNOP, but really just aren't quite sure how. Or perhaps you actually have an SNOP process, but you're going through some bumps. So we really feel that this could be beneficial to anybody uh, who's trying to get started with this topic. So, you know, Hugo, SNOP has been around for a long time. If I go back to my history with MRP and what is now ERP, we're talking in excess of 30 plus years, 40 years. Where does, how long has SNOP been around? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's as you pointed out. I mean, SNOP is nothing new, right? It's been around for around 30, between 30 and 40 years. Uh, the first company that started, you know, implementing and developing SNOP uh, was back in the, in the 80s, right? And um, so, but definitely, you know, re regardless of the time that has passed, one of the things, I think the fundamental things have remained there. Definitely there's some touches, right, that we're gonna discuss and we're gonna cover as, as we go. But um, the fundamental things, which is actually, and we're gonna go through the core, the core fundamental, uh, you know, aspects of the process, but they still remain there, right? Great, so it's not totally new. Um, so what is sales and operations planning will be covered? What are the common challenges and how to avoid the pitfalls, the benefits and the return on investment of sales and operations planning? I'm, I'm very interested in that. The roadmap to help you leverage ERP dark data. Interesting, I, I'm, I'm intrigued. And the case studies and examples of scorecards from businesses that use ERP data for sales and operations planning. So there's our agenda today. So again, I said this will be a conversation. Um, it will, we will open it up for a general Q&A uh, later in the presentation. So please jot down some questions. If you have an urgent question, there is a text box chat and we encourage you to use it. So feel free, we are monitoring that. And as I mentioned, this will be recorded and we will share it later. So Hugo, um, you know, really, people have talked to me about forecasting. You know, what is the definition of forecasting? What is a forecast? I, I've seen people speak to sales, production, MPS, there's all kinds of different forecasts. But maybe enlighten me a little bit, help us here. What, are you, what is sales and operations planning? Awesome, I think, you, well, you, first of all, you mentioned forecasting. I think forecasting is a key component of any SNOP process. 
Uh, and the reason why it's a key component of any SNLP process is simply because although forecast is going to be always wrong, that's, a, that's something that you know, sometimes people believe that having forecasters in place means that we're going to predict the future perfectly. That's not the case. It's not going to happen. But you know, the forecast is our best estimation of what the future would look like, right? From a business standpoint, from a market standpoint, from a customer standpoint. So it's a reflection of your future demand. That demand could be based on orders that you're going to receive or potentially, you know, the expectation of a business that is going to be, you know, acquired in the future, so right? quotes, orders, exactly. customer demand. Okay. So, so, so that's why I think, and I put this, this picture on purpose here, because SNOP is all about balance in our organization. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more, but I want to start with demand. So what I was mentioning, you know, demand forecast in terms of uh, understanding the behavior of our customers, understanding the markets that we're competing in, and the geographies, the countries, and, uh, and providing a, uh, an estimate of the categories even uh, that, we're, that we're forecasting and proposing for, for our business in the future. On the other hand, when it comes to the balance in this equation, we are uh, talking about things like the supply. So we got our best estimate about the future in terms of the orders and, uh, and uh, the business that is gonna come to our, to our uh, company in the future. And at the same time, we need to now consider, you know, what are the supply chain aspects of that, you know, the, our ability to fulfill that business. And then we have things like materials, we have uh, considerations around the equipment that we have in our business, uh, the labor, uh, our warehouses and our distribution. So, this picture, what actually tells you is that SNOP in their basic definition is how a business gets ready for balancing demand, understanding the demand needs, the demands for and needs from the customers and preparing the supply chain to get ready for that demand that is coming, right? Or should be coming. And therefore, at the end of the day, what in, you know, the basic statement I could say is that balancing demand and supply but with a purpose and what is the purpose is achieving your business goals right so having having the ability or getting the organization in a better position to accomplish those business goals in the future by getting supply ready for that future uh, prospect or future demand that is coming in the pipeline well it really sounds like if if we can't measure manage it we can't manage it if we can't measure it really i mean and so clearly this is going to require some sort of a backbone. So people who are using an ERP are probably in a good position to take advantage of, of these next best practices or that the journey of growth. I think that's, that's very clear. I mean, companies that already have a uh, backbone, an ERP in place that allow them to uh, have visibility about their orders, visibility about their production you know, scale, visibility about the, their inventory levels, are much better suited, you know, to, to move towards the adoption of practices like SNLP. Now, one of the things that I wanted to mention here, and I think is, is, is an important point to, to even start talking about it and clarify, is, you know, SNLP is a long-term planning process. It's not a process that, you know, you're discussing about the very, very short term, that the order that you have to ship tomorrow out of the warehouse. That's not SNLP. SNOP is a process that balances demand and supply in a long-term planning horizon. And when I mean long-term, I mean uh, when you're planning your business 12 to 18 months out, you're thinking about a little bit more strategic things. Now you're getting into, you know, thinking about SNOP, right? So you are, you're outside of your execution window. Of course, execution has to be very much related to your plans in the SNOP process. But you got to remember that, you know, the balance is the, 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 the likelihood of that balance, you know, happening in the future is, is much better, you know, you're much better prepared to, to, to find that balance if you're looking those 12 to 18 months out, you know, in the planning horizon. So not to be confused with the fact that it only works out that far, it, it really means you're looking at a continuous horizon and that time fence could be unique to that company. It could be just in time, in which case, Yes, I'm looking at 12 months, but really it's the next three months that are critical. And in fact, my planning 
and ability to produce, depending on the supply nature of my supply, might be even tighter. So it might be weeks. So in the big picture, it's a consideration of all the things that could affect, it sounds like, that change or exactly. that, that horizon. Absolutely. Okay. So this is an, an overview of how the sales and operations planning process looks like in, in any company. Uh, I mean, there's some companies that you could say, you know, instead of having five steps in the process, maybe you can find companies that have implemented only four. But in general, the message here for, for, for everyone to be uh, clear with is SNOP is a structured process. So that requires a certain cadence that happens uh, a, on a monthly basis. So every month to, you get into a cycle of events, meetings, and, and things that have to happen in order to enable your organization with a sales and operations planning process. And I'm gonna start with uh, the first one, which is uh, the product review. So the product review is uh, an activity that, and I'm gonna describe it at a very high level first, and then we can get a little bit more into the details, but you know, at a high level first, so every, every time you run your SNOP process cycle, normally you start with your the product review meeting, product review week. Uh, and what that means. So particularly this means that you get, you know, for instance, the product management people talking to sales and marketing, uh, elaborating about, you know, the life cycle management of your products. So how that looks like for the next 12 months. So are you gonna have new products coming in, in your company? Are you planning to discontinue products because they already went through their end of life cycle? So the first week, Pretty much, you know, you look at, at a more strategic level, you look at your portfolio of products, the things that you're offering to the market, and, and you make some strategic decisions of, around, you know, the portfolio that you want to have in the future as a company and offer to your customers. That's the first step in the process. The second step in the process at a high level, again, is once you have defined your portfolio of products for the long term and the changes to that portfolio in terms of in and outs, the second step in the process is to forecast. So create a, an estimate of your future orders, you know, that you're going to receive for those products that you are, uh, uh, you know, planning in your, in your, uh, to have in your portfolio. Now, what I mean by forecast, forecast is basically, you know, composed of a couple of things. Number one, creating your baseline forecast. So and normally organizations, what organizations do, they, they normally they have their ERP, they have, you know, historic, you know, historic information and data around what their orders and shipments have, have been over the last, you know, number of number of years or number of months. Uh, and normally they factor some statistical modeling to come up with, you know, their baseline forecast. Once they have that baseline forecast, what normally organizations do, they factor, you know, new information into that baseline forecast information like, as an example, Sales is coming to the table saying, I just closed a new, you know, uh, arrangement with a future customer. That customer is going to bring us, you know, bring, you know, additional business that we haven't, we didn't have in the past. So therefore we need to factor that baseline forecast plus this additional business that is coming in the pipeline. And it's going to hopefully, you know, materialize in month number four, as an example, right? Uh, and then of the other thing that it gets discussed in the demand review meeting normally are, are things like, you know, the key assumptions of your forecast. So why are you assu assuming that your forecast for certain categories is going to increase 5%? What are, the, what are the assumptions behind? Are you getting more listings? Are you increasing your coverage? Are you opening a new facility where, or a new office, sales office in a certain territory that is going to drive additional business? All of those discussions happen in the context of the demand review meeting um, that, that brings sales, marketing, and normally one person from planning uh, to that meeting, right? So, so this is not a production forecast. So this no. is unconstrained, unfiltered, raw, what sales is saying so that we operationally can figure out how confident are we of that. And that's a great comment because that's the exact word that we use. So it's the unconstrained demand forecast. So in this step in the process, there's no discussions about our ability as a company to supply to that expectation. It's just a discussion around what we believe our customers are gonna require and need from, from our company. 
in terms of orders, in terms of future business. Uh, and, but the discussion around now constraining that plan, so bringing now probably you know, the numbers that are expectations back to the supply reality, that happens in the third step in the process, which is called the supply review meeting. So the supply review meeting is the instance where now you understand what sales and marketing are bringing to the table, expectation for the future. Now you think and you review internally your capacity from, from many angles. So capacity from an equipment standpoint, from material standpoint, from labor standpoint, from logistics, from your warehouse capacity. So you bring all of those supply restrictions or, or considerations to the table and then you figure out whether your estimates for the future from a demand unconstrained demand forecast perspective can be met or not and the discussion that happens particularly in week three in this case is a discussion that has to do with you know particularly are we able as a company to fulfill those expectations coming from sales and our customers or do we have some, some constraints in the plan that we need to adjust and make evident for people to make a decision about? It? That's the plan. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, similar to the, the previous step in the process, so you, you talk about key assumptions of the plan, you talk about you know, the demand and supply balance, and also you, you review metrics and the root cost uh, analysis and corrective actions uh, from the plan. Very good. Step number four in the process, and I, I'm describing every step in the process, but I think it's useful for you guys to, to get a better perspective about you know, the key inputs and outputs of every step in the process. Step number four is uh, business integration, what we call business integration. What, what business integration means? It means that so far in the demand review meeting and in the supply review meeting, we have talked about units. So, so things like, for instance, if you are producing, you know, uh, food, and, food and beverage, you know, products, sometimes it's kilograms. So you're talking about units, quantities. You haven't talked yet about dollars. Now, in stage number four, which is business integration, now is when finance come to the equation. So normally in this meeting, you have finance people sitting in this meeting and even leading the, the meeting together with planning and together with sales. Uh, you dollarize the plan. What we, call, what we mean by dollarize the plan, we mean that everything that we discussed so far in terms of units now gets converted into financial projections, dollars, or our, our outlook for the next 12 months in terms of our revenue, our, our profits, our cost, our inventory turns, our inventory value, the working capital that we, that we have in the organization projected for the next 12 months. So, so it's actually, that's why it's called business integration because it's actually bring demand connected with supply and provides a meaning from a financial standpoint. And uh, you know, the purpose of that st step in the process is to dollarize the plan, come up with the financial projections, review the potential gaps that the organization may have as compared to their targets or their budget or their goals and, provide, and come up with an action plan. So determining, let's say, for instance, in certain country, in certain category, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm opening a huge gap versus my projection and my budget expectations or my goals. So that's something that we need to address. Okay. And, and that's the instance, instance for getting everyone together to address that potential shortage. Right. We wouldn't want a wayward buyer to go off and buy millions of dollars of product based on something sales has discussed and only to find out that there's an engineering change pending, we're not gonna make it the same way, so the products change, and that we just don't have the buy-in for management. So that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Absolutely, and step number five uh, is what we call the executive, executive review. An executive review primarily is at the end of the month, at the end of the cycle, uh, with all the highlights of the process, and the projections, financial projections, uh, normally organizations present this information to the top management. Guys, here's, here the, here's the outlook, here's how things look like, and uh, green light on certain key business decisions that need to be made. Uh, so top, top management is fully aware of what's going on and is connected with you know, the, the entire organization in terms of the key activities that need to happen. 
So Hugo, you put this into action. Um, you know, clearly this is something taught by Apex Capex, um, but you know, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. You know, putting it into action, and you know, what kind of a this looks like it needs an update. I mean, if I was going back to my my education and, and supply chain and discussions, where you know, one of the observations were that the Russians had a five year plan and they would set it, and it was based on weight. If you you needed to produce this tonnage they would set it and five years would go by and they'd start up another plan. Clearly in today's JIT, just in time and, and lean world, this needs to be iterative. What are we talking about in terms of these cycles? Is this uh, every six months? Is this daily, weekly? What does this look like? I think that's a, that's a great question. And I, and I, and I got similar question from, from many times from, from customers, from clients. Uh, there's a huge difference between a budgeting exercise when you create your budget once a year uh, and you project your, your you, get, you get your best guess regarding you know your future in the next 12 months. That's not SNOP. SNOP is a monthly cycle. So you run this on a monthly basis and there's a lot, all of those meetings that I just described happen, you know, at individual weeks through that month. So as an example, and that's, you know, allow me to go to the- But hang on a second. Yep. There aren't five weeks in every month. <laughs> so what are we talking about here? Uh, product review, clearly, are there any changes to the product? That's probably not gonna take a week or, or you're not talking about a week's worth of effort. Are these a one hour meeting? Yeah. What, so, what are we talking about? Exactly, so of course there's, I mean, there's five meetings that happen through the month. Each meeting would take around an hour. Of course, there's some prep work that is required. And I think that's most of the heavy lifting for organizations to get ready for that meeting. But in general, we're, we're talking about five hours of you know meetings happening through the month. As an example, and this is just a guideline in terms of timing, normally, you know, I'm back to your point. So those this cycle, this SNOP process runs every month. So and every week of that particular month, you have an activity to perform. So in this case, as an example, the product review meeting normally happens in week four, right? Or the, the week before starting a new calendar month, I would say, right? Then in week one, you have normally your forecasting meeting, your demand review meeting, or you're getting together, getting together with sales, marketing, getting inputs. Week number two of the month, calendar month, you have your supply review meeting. So now you bring operations people to the table to discuss about the future forecast. Week number three, we have what we call the business integration, bringing finance people to dollarize the plan. And finally, week four, uh, the executive uh, review meeting with, with the top management. So at the end of the day, you're right. So there's five steps in the process, but both, I mean, a couple of them, you know, the pro review and executive review happen in normally in week four. Great. So, you know, I guess, as we get into the next steps of this discussion, I guess, Hugo, you've, you've been head of supply chain for pharma and consumer products, uh, heavy equipment, divisions of Caterpillar. Uh, tell me, why is this such a challenge? Why, why, can't, why can't this be achieved out of the box? Why isn't everybody doing it? I think that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. And um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of work that this process involves. That's, that's, a, that's a reality. I mean, and I, I don't wanna sure, sure code this, and I, I wanna be very straightforward too. Definitely, for, in order to, for our organization to get ready for SNOP, there's, there's, there's heavy lifting involved. So there's, there's activities that need to happen. As an example, this slide that I'm showing you here, this is how an, 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 an SNOP meeting looks like, you know, in a nutshell. Right, so you ha you have here discussions around, and each of those you know snapshots here is like one one slide, one slide slide of a you know a deck, right? So as an example, you you talk about things like your your metrics, your KPIs. How was your performance last month? So that involves, of course, people calculating numbers, crunching numbers get into you know the metrics and the numbers that drive your business. So you also discuss about key topics and decisions required, and also opportunities and risk. So there's a lot of things that need to be put in place in order to facilitate this process moving forward. Okay, so it sounds like having that right data consistently and accurately ready before the meetings is, is part of the, the challenge. 
It is, it is. And, and, and again, this is not uh, in ourselves saying that, and I'm going to share some, some stories, you know, uh, in a few slides, but that, that's exactly the point. So there's, there's a challenge uh, that needs to be addressed in terms of collecting the information, making that information available uh, so people can make better decisions in a, in a, in a timely fashion. Now, so one of the questions that I normally get from, from people has to do with, well, what are the typical, typical benefits of, uh, you know, uh, uh, implementing SNLP? Uh, and that's, you know, that's a normal question. And I think it's, it's very, because if you're going to invest effort and time and resources, definitely you're, you're looking for a return on investment. So what, what do I get out of this process? And that's what, you know, uh, and this is, a, I'm just sharing some, some uh, insights here that, was, were, were put together for, for this study particularly. And this is a study was put, was put together a couple of years ago and uh, companies that were audited, 72% of those companies were primarily in the manufacturing space. 15% um, of the companies were distributors and retailers. 7% of the companies uh, interviewed were uh, logistics companies. Uh, six, around 60% of these companies were interviewed here in North, in North America and around 50% of the, the, the companies had revenues between $50 million and, and $1 billion. Here are some of the things that these guys, these companies mentioned. The, 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 you know, they, they have, of course, they're not in early stages in their maturity process. They already achieved some, some successes in the process. They already went through the early stages of SNLP but they have achieved certain level of maturity that allow them to improve their performance in a few aspects as an ex as, as various examples here so as an example increased forecast accuracy so companies increasing increasing your on time delivery to customers inventory reduction that's an important one so there's a lot of companies that benefit from implementing snop and drive inventory reduction or optimization um, logistics and operating costs. So for instance, as a concrete example, so if companies improving their forecast accuracy, the accuracy of their forecasts and their projections, and as a consequence, reducing the expedited cost, their logistic cost to expedite, you know, uh, certain, certain, you know, freights or potentially, you know, the cost, the inbound or the outbound transportation cost as a consequence of improving your forecast accuracy. Uh, so there's there's a lot of benefits and companies have realized that. So, you know, I recognize companies 50 million to a billion. That sounds like companies that have a bigger problem, but it sounds like properly adjusted. This could actually be effective for any business. I mean, if I'm an auto parts supplier in high volume just in time, I may have to factor the accuracy of my customer's forecast. So they may have done a part of the puzzle for me, but I still need to manage to that. Um, and then if I'm a project or engineer to order company, there's still a supply of common materials and my, my ability to execute effectively would really rely on this process. That, that's hundred percent true. I mean, of course, this is only a reference, but every company that has some level of complexity in the operation can definitely benefit from, from implementing a business process that connects demand supply and the business in terms of, you know, finance and the top management. So I think that's a benefit for everyone. So, but here's a question, right? And, and I think that's, that's an important, you know, point for discussion too, is, is really SNLP working for every single company? Uh, you, you right, rightly mentioned, so SNLP is nothing new, has been around for 30 plus years. So one question that is fair to ask is, is SNLP, you know, driving, driving value for every single company that already started that journey or not? And, and, and here I'm going to share some, some insights that were actually uh, put together by a company called Supply Chain Insights. Uh, they did a study and sales and operations uh, planning study uh, uh, mid last year. Uh, and they, they, they try to assess you know, the level of satisfaction with SNLP in general, in companies. So they interviewed uh, many companies in, in different space, different industries, different sizes. And, uh, and actually they repeat that exercise um, three years later. So the first time they did this exercise was back in 2016. And they repeated that exercise uh, in 2019. So back in 2016, the level of satisfaction with, in general, with uh, 
with the implementation of SNLP was around 65%. So that means that 65% of the companies interviewed at that time uh, mentioned that you know, the implementation of the process was very effective or extremely effective or effective. So, so the process allowed them to accomplish their business goals, obtain you know, their inventory reductions, uh, attain you know, their better inventory or, or you know, service levels, so bring business value. Now, three years later, they run this exercise again, and the result, it was like this. So the level of satisfaction with the process dropped from 65% down to 35%. So 35% of the companies now, three years later, you know, mentioned that their SNOP process was effective or extremely effective, right? So it's interesting, Hugo. So, you know, all I can think in the back of my mind was that I read a study in 2015, possibly 2016, that spoke to the idea that close to a thousand business professionals are retiring every day in the United States. I'm sure other countries, Canada, Mexico, around the world, are probably experiencing something similar. It just seems like we're not developing and creating consistent disciplines to carry these processes forward. Does it work? It, it, it seems like in 2016 it worked. Why wouldn't it work in 2019? Do you, what, what would you attribute to this? Why, what would you think that uh, would lead to this other than the, the brain drain of people? <laughs> I think that's a great point. And uh, the global shortage of supply chain professionals is hitting, you know, pretty much every company in, in, in the world, I would say, right? So this is something that is, that is documented today as one of the, uh, the top reasons why uh, sometimes supply chains cannot move forward. Now, the good thing about this study that it was put together, as I said, you know, in May last year, is the fact that they also were able to document or try to understand the why. Why this is happening? Why? What's the reason why or what are the key reasons that explain this drop in the level of satisfaction? And that's something that I'm going to share in the next slide. So again, the same study coming from the same source, and actually they listed top down the main reasons why they, uh, the companies consider that the initial implementation of SNLP, SNLP was facing some, some challenges. And, uh, and we can see here top down, the number one and most common reason that the companies argued is uh, the difficulty of uh, getting you know, the right data in a timely fashion. Uh, and number two, you can see here lack of support from other functions and not having the technologies that support the process and, and many other aspects. But it's interesting to understand, you know, what are the top one, two, three, four reasons why this is happening. So again, not measured, not managed, not considered important, and possibly not seen as value by certain people, or maybe it's a labor that just seems too onerous. Interesting. Okay. Awesome. So I think it is worth asking ourselves, and I think that's part of the, uh, the, the dialogue that we also wanted to create uh, with, with, you, with you, is the fact that why this is happening. So why getting right data in a timely fashion is challenging. So why organizations, although they may have their own ERP in place, and most of them actually in that survey, they have their own ERP in place. They already have an ERP uh, and uh, they are operating with, with, with best practices around technology, but why this is happening? So why getting the right data in a timely fashion is challenging? So, and here's what we wanted to introduce, you know, a concept that, that although it's not new, I think, I don't know if, if many people have already heard about this, but it's the concept of uh, dark data. And uh, the concept of that dark data is primarily, you know, is data that, every business acquires, right? Uh, through various systems, computer networks, operations. So you, you, you may have your own way of keeping record of transactions in your organization, but you collect a lot of information, a lot of data, but you just collect the information, you store it, but the organization is not really taking advantage of that data, that information in a more insightful way. So everything you show here shows, it speaks to me of structure. This is not 
Excel that evolves over different Excel versions over years and months and so on. And, you know, particularly for the audience on the call today, you know, typically these people have an ERP system. But I don't think everybody understands all the value of some of the data they have and that they've been generating. So if I was to create a purchase a requirement that had a purchase order, which has dates, it has deliveries, it has actuals, it has price variance, it has performance on the vent. There's all kinds of things that can come with that data that we are tracking today, but they may not actually be using this for decision support. Uh, absolutely. I, one of the things that I, I say to companies when I, when I work with them in terms of uh, supporting, providing some advice, is that almost virtually every company that has an ERP in place, I would say they have a gold mine in terms of data. So you have the average company have accumulated transactions over years, accumulated an, an example of those transactions. I'm going to explain that a little bit more, but things like, as you might, as you rightly mentioned, so purchase orders. So your buyers, your, your purchasing people creating purchase orders for years, you have accumulated, you know, maybe millions of transactions over those years. And uh, so, but the question is, what are you doing with that information? Are you, are you, you know, extracting value out of that data that is stored in your ERP or in any or you know transactional system? Are you really getting value out of that to improve your decision making process or not? And, and bringing that back to sales and operations planning, if we are developing quotes within a centralized repository through a CRM and an opportunity management system, I could probably measure how many quotes I've done for a customer and how many of those turn into orders. And that might be, that might be a confidence factor that I go into operationalize from what might be a, you know, a hopeful forecast from a sales rep right down to an execution plan that management can bet on. That's exactly right. So, and this is why, so from, from a perspective of structured data or traditional enterprise data, CRMs, ERPs, data warehouse are like the perfect place where people accumulate this dark data. Uh, and that's, we believe that that's something that companies have to realize there's an opportunity for leveraging all that data and turn that data into better, better you know, actions and uh, to drive your business forward in the context of, of course, the, of the SNOP process. So I think we, we already kind of mentioned this slightly at this point, but I think ERPs in general drive significant business value and help, help organizations to structure the processes, structure their, their, their operation, capture you know, their transactions, and, and provides a, a, you know, a very good framework for organizations to structure their operations. Now, they also become if they're not utilized properly sometimes, they become the perfect place to store dark data. So the perfect place to store, you know, purchase orders, sales orders, shipments, MRP suggestion that stays sometimes there in the ERP without really, you know, you know, the organization try to extract value in terms of the data and the information that that data could provide for improving your, your performance as a business. So many of my clients ask me, you know, John, where can we take it from here? And, you know, we like to talk about the journey. This definitely speaks to the fact that now that I've been running the system for a while, it's, it's time to monetize that data and start to have the payback that gives us daily decision support. And I think that's the, uh, that's the key word. So, so how can we leverage the, the investment that companies already made in an ERP Leverage that investment, leverage the data that is available in that ERP and transform that into a monetize that. You mentioned that word. I like that word. Monetize that for the purpose of the organization making better decisions and driving the business towards what, what, what they want. Now, one of the challenges, particularly in, with supply chain data, and that's why I, I, you know, I, I choose this title here. So supply chain data is even darker. And why is that? Why is it even darker than, let's say, finance data or sales data sometimes? Uh, because of a couple of things. Number one is because, in general, the nature of supply chain data is complex. So supply chain is a, is a complex process that connects you know, multiple parties, that connects multiple sources of information sometimes. So there's a lot of complexity involved in supply chain 
and particularly in managing supply chain data. And because of particularly, I would say three things. Number one, because data in supply chain is sizable. So there's, there's a lot of data that you accumulate. You accumulate a lot of data. Uh, and again, I'm just going back to examples. So if, if you have been uh, operating an ERP for five years and you have purchased, you know, and created a lot of transactions, imagine the number of PO lines that you have accumulated over, you know, five years. It could be, it could be large, very large. So that's massive information that is sitting in an ERP and not necessarily being, being manipulated, right? Number two is because particularly supply chain data is also impure. And impurity means that sometimes, you know, when back in the day when some definitions were made while implementing, you know, the ERP, you know, the adoption in the organization maybe wasn't that, that high at that time. So maybe, you know, the organization struggled to really implement some of the practices recommended when they implemented the ERP. And therefore, that drove certain level of, you know, impurity in the data collection. So therefore, five years later, you could maybe sometimes face the fact that you forgot about a certain field, let's say in the purchase order, that you, have, you haven't populated for years. And now that you want to measure, let's say as an example, the performance of your suppliers, so you don't have that information available. And third is inconsistent for the same reason or similar reasons. So sometimes, you know, following the example of the purchase order, sometimes, you know, you have turnover, turnover in, your, in your people, in your employees. So therefore, you know, it, it, if you don't have a solid, you know, training process, sometimes, you know, one person is, is completing the entire purchase order fields, but the next person is not necessarily doing the same thing. And therefore, there's inconsistency in the data that you created and uh, over time. So this, again, consistency, process rigor, and understanding the linkages here of how a customer opportunity turns into customer demand, turns into production planning and supply chain planning. And this is the whole SNOP. This looks like a bit of a spider map from a data <laughs> model from an, from an ERP system, how everything connects. Exactly. So, and back to your point, I think one of the, things, the important things that I would like to share with, with the audience is the fact that, uh, well, how companies are trying to resolve this issue. I mean, because this is an issue that as we, as we, as we saw before, so it's a challenge for companies today in the context of the SNOP process to get access to data in a timely fashion. So the question is how leading companies or other companies are trying to resolve this issue. So, the thing is that, you know, it, one of the fundamental things I would say is try to leverage your ERP data. And I think that's one of the first number one advice. So you already, company already invested in an ERP. The ERP is working. You're, you're, you're recording your transactions. You're creating, you're, 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 you brought more structure to your business. You have accumulated data over time. So the first point would be, how do, how do you leverage you know, your data that is in your ERP. So companies today, as we speak, so they have a couple of different ways to approach this problem. I'm not saying that this is the optimal way. I'm just, sh I'm just sharing what companies do today to try to overcome this challenge, which is trying to pull and try to leverage data from the ERP. The option A is hiring business analysts. So companies sometimes, Believe that, you know, the direction in order to, you know, come up with the metrics, the indicators to run your SNLP process and also drive your business is hiring business analysts. But the challenge with that is that on the one hand, you have uh, increasing your headcount, of course. Number two, it becomes expensive. So bringing a, 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 you know, a business analyst uh, in certain territories could be, you know, up to seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 if you consider, you know, the, the annual salary and, uh, and everything. So limited scope, so it's hard to find one analyst that covers every single aspect of your supply chain and is able to come up with, you know, analytics and, uh, and metrics for, for your entire process that doesn't, you know, limit the, the error, right? So there's, I mean, we're human beings, right? So we, we, we make mistakes every day. And the same thing happens when you manipulate, you know, information in, uh, in, in spreadsheets, as an example. Uh, the, there's, and definitely there's a risk also, you know, of uh, people's people turnover, 
right? So, I mean, you hire an analyst, it's a great person, it's a great worker. He allows you to come up with a lot of nice and stuff, you know, and Excel and everything, but that person is gone. So you have to start all over again, or at least try to understand what that person put together. And the outcome, whenever we see organizations trying to solve this challenge by hiring more people, the outcome of this is operation full of spreadsheets, operation full of, you know, uh, massive spreadsheets, working with, uh, you know, uh, analysts trying to come up with the answers, utilizing spreadsheets. Option B, companies that try to implement uh, business intelligent tools. So particularly what they do, normally they, they hire even more employees, right? because they have to assemble a team in order to come up with a VI implementation, that becomes more expensive. So you have to spend even more money hiring the right people, specialized resources. And this is an important one. I think in my experience and based on what, what I've seen in the organizations that I work for is normally VI developments internally in the organization, they prioritize you know, sales, finance, and normally supply chain developments get somehow deprioritized. And, and that, ha that happens, why? Because you know, the most visible part of the organization maybe is sales and, mar and marketing and, and finance, and therefore you know, supply chain developments get deprioritized. And that's a challenge whenever you wanna implement uh, in-house uh, VI tools. And therefore, as an outcome, what happens is that normally projects get, they don't start or they get stalled or definitely they don't deliver the value that you respect. So Hugo, I mean, in my career, one of the things I help explain to people is that ERP stands for an Excel replacement program, but it sounds like hiring a business analyst who might come in and, and manage to this level, it seems like that's one thing that is universal to them. You know, they don't know the ERP, they don't know, but, and they won't know all ERPs, but they do know spreadsheets. A recent study I saw from Harvard Business Review said that nine out of 10 spreadsheets have at least one typo. And if that's a formula, that could mean what? I don't know, thousands of dollars, maybe tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. But again, if we're asking people to go off and use spreadsheets, if that's the, the experience that you've seen, really aren't we spending more time collecting data than we are analyzing it? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I, I think I, I, I normally use use analogies to, to make things easier. I think this is like uh, an hour clock, an hourglass, right? So normally organizations and in general analysts, they spend in organizations 80% of their time uh, in data manipulation activities, crunching data, pulling data from the ERP and working in spreadsheets and less than 20% of their time really analyzing the information, really uh, proposing new ideas and innovating and bringing those new ideas to the manager and saying, hey, here's an opportunity for saving X amount of money. We believe that that's a problem, right? So we, I think, I think the, if, if we can you know, help companies and companies can find ways to implement solutions that turn and flip that proportion of time over, so now you have analysts spending 80% of their time trying to find, you know, new opportunities to improve your performance and less than 20% of the time scrubbing data, that's, that's a big, a big game, right? A big win. Now, in terms of uh, one question that normally people ask me is, well, how do I start? So I'm, I'm, today I'm working with, spreads, with, with Excel spreadsheets or I have my ERP, but I'm not really utilizing the data that I have in the system. How do I start? So uh, what I wanted to share here is a, a graph that shows you a little bit of a maturity model or a journey that companies go through. And this is a, this is a generic model, but applies to pretty much every single company that, that wanted to increase the level of intelligence and uh, of their operation in terms of getting analytics, getting metrics and running their, S, their SNOP more effectively. So the, th the big thing here and the key message here is that if you look at the first two bars, most of the organizations that have, you know, operate under spreadsheets and, you know, with low usage of their data and their ERP, normally they will sit in bar number one or two, which is creating a standard reports, 
using Excel and or ad hoc reports and manipulations. So I think the big gain for organizations that want to move from that stage to the next step is to move from, from bar number one and two into uh, having the ability to explore through the data and understand you know, the drill downs, understand what, what, where the pro what is the problem that is really driving you know, my inconsistencies in the process, what are the things that are really you know, creating a gap in my performance and, uh, and, and having the ability to, to have some tools that allow them to develop that view from top down and conversely, it really drives and creates a leapfrog, you know, for them. So for going from the ad hoc reporting and the spreadsheets or the low usage of the ERP data into a more sophisticated, you know, state. Now, there's a lot of buzzwords out there in the market at the moment. If you go to a conference, you will, you will listen, you know, people talking about, you know, AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, predictive modeling, and all of that. We truly believe that for a company that is, that is today working in, uh, with basic utilization of their ERP capabilities, and they're not necessarily leveraging their data today, and they primarily work in Excel, so their interest should be, you know, how do, we, how, do, how do I get to the next level? Don't get stressed about, you know, the vast words about AI, machine learning, blockchain, and supply chain, those things like, you know, there, maybe there will come in the future for you, but you know the, the next step is how do you look at this maturity model? You identify where your company is sitting today, and what's the next step for me? Uh, what is the next step for 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 really creating an impact in how my supply chain and my data my data is captured? So you know, speaking to this term, the journey and and what clients uh, go through in an ERP, um, I always think of the words crawl, walk, run. You know, how do we move from crawling to walking to running? Clearly, optimization is running, but for some companies, running might just be the fact that they're getting alerts and they can do something about it. You know, it doesn't need to be an AI solution. But one thing that this deck or this slide shows me or this graph is that really Excel is not a competitive advantage because it does not offer structured data that can truly give me root cause information because by the time I get to this third bar, I need to be able to drill down and believe the numbers and have consistency. So process, going back to people, process, and technology, you know, how do we leverage this technology with consistent processes? This seems to be really the ground floor for how to, how to make this work in an organization, how to make sales and operations planning effective. Absolutely. And, and I wanted to, you know, provide one example and maybe this example could uh, resonate with, with some of you uh, because it provides uh, an idea of a company that uh, in this case is a mid-sized manufacturing company of, of beauty products. They, uh, they have accumulated over, let's say between five to, five to seven years, I guess, uh, operating their ERP. They have accumulated around 25 million transactions in their system, in their database. They operate and they manage around 450 different suppliers. They uh, have in their product master around 15,000 different items, considering you know, the different items that uh, you purchase, you produce, and, and, and you ship out. So in this example, they very, very basic questions that they were raising. So what's, what's the delivery performance of my suppliers? So basic question that every, every company sometimes you know, asks themselves, you know, what, what are the good guys, the bad guys from a, from a performance standpoint, my suppliers, who are they performing? So what is the challenge with it? What are the challenges with this? Uh, and particularly this company was facing. So number one, where is the data? So although they have an ERP, that doesn't mean that you know where the data resides, in which specific table, which specific field, what is the information that is, that is relevant for the analysis that you wanna, you wanna answer. So if you wanna answer the business question, uh, about your delivery of, of performance of your suppliers, what is the, the, the information that you, have, you, should, you should consider for, for running that exercise? And also which resources? So do I have resources internally to, to calculate this, to, to come up with the recommendations? Uh, what are the right process metrics? So how do I measure that? So how do I measure the performance of my suppliers? I mean, there's, there's multiple ways to approach that, that, that discussion, as well as how do I calculate that, that those numbers 
and, and who's going to keep this running in the future? Who's going to continue calculating, maintaining those, uh, making interpretation of the results and feeding the SNOP process with the right KPIs and metrics to enable the, the business decisions uh, that the business requires. So this is an example of probably, you know, I mean, some of you in the, in the line that may potentially experience some similar challenges, try to, try to come up with, with answers to those questions. Very good. So clearly it can be done. And as we look at this, you know, SNOP is definitely a process, a machine, you know, I like your term here, machine, when operated successfully drives significant business value. But like anything, it needs consistency, it needs discipline, nothing comes easily. The companies who are mastering SNOP place adequate, need to place adequate focus on people, process, and technology and find that balance. So if we're spending all of our time populating spreadsheets, that's not a great process. Um, if we're throwing darts on a wall, that's probably not a good one either. So somewhere in the middle, there has to be some tools and techniques to get there. And from what I'm hearing is that consistency of data is a real challenge. An ERP is definitely the right place to start. So, you know, this is typically a group of customers on the call today, but if you don't have an ERP, we can definitely help you with that. But, you know, the, the idea of big data and information really relies on trust and structure, or at least understanding how that data was gathered and what factors. So we can't be a data-driven company moving from reactionary to predictive and, and grab insights unless we have the data to make those decisions. Interesting. Um, so at this point, you know, I guess I'm gonna open it up for anybody that has any questions. Um, we have a couple questions. Hugo, do you wanna maybe bring one up that, uh, that came up while we were here? Yeah, so there's, there's one question here that says, uh, I heard about a process or a tool called IBP. So what's the difference with uh, SNLP? So IBP, Integrated Business Pro Planning? Planning, planning Okay, yeah. so tell me, what, what, what is your take on that? I think this is, I'm gonna share my personal perspective. I think, I think a well-oiled, unarticulated, SNOP process uh, already answers pretty much all the questions that an, an integrated business planning process supposedly uh, brings to the table. So to me, there's, there's, no, there's no clear distinction. I would say uh, if you run an SNOP process very well articulated and, and structured in a company, I don't really think that there's, there's, there's additional value incremental value for from bringing you know an integrated business planning process which is something that some people is uh, proposing right? i might be dating myself but you know mrp offered forecast planning cycles etc and eventually they turned it into mrp2 which became an integrated business process it's really a generic term isn't it for for what ends up being yeah. a well managed sales and operation planning okay interesting uh, there's another question here um, what is a rough estimate of the cost of setting up a BI development team? Um, have you, what have you seen out there? Yeah, because that's one of the options that I mentioned before that uh, companies utilize. They could uh, utilize spreadsheets as their primary source. Option two, implement uh, BI tools. Uh, I think starting from three people. So you at least need a data architect. You need a... Um, BI developer and, uh, and a data analyst. So, so think about that. So you're, you're, you're talking about minimum $250,000 in salaries uh, per year. So that could get quite expensive. Um, so I guess, you know, the question that I see here on the screen is, is there any other, are there any other tools in the market that support an SOP process? SNOP process. I mean, definitely, there's there's many tools out there in the market uh, that support an SNOP process, uh, but, it, but it depends as a recommendation for a company thinking about that, it depends on your strategy and your budget. So therefore, I mean, you can, you, you can see options like advanced planning tool systems, but they're very costly and, uh, and potentially you're not gonna get the return investment that you, you're looking for in a short period of time. But definitely there are solutions out there. It's a matter of you know, aligning strategy, budget, and expectations. 
Great. Are there any other questions from anybody that wants to uh, jump in? Okay. Well, I'd, I'd like to put a wrap on this, but you know, before I do, you know, clearly there are opportunities out here to engage, and not, a, not one size does not fit all. So, you know, we could have a client that has five million in sales. They've been running ERP or just put in an, MP, an ERP system. And they're looking for best practices. They're looking for how do I get from here to there? Um, there is no simple easy button, but there is a journey and there's a logical journey. And what, you know, my insight from a 6S perspective, we've got a lot of, you know, well-trained supply chain execution people who can help our clients come up to speed. But, you know, if I look at SNOP, it may actually require that you have processes for creating quotes. Uh, for tracking opportunities, um, for actually moving toward a sales forecasting model, possibly then looking at, are you using production plans and MRP and MPS? Is there a production forecast versus scheduling? How well are, we, and then just measuring all of that. I guess that anybody who's on the call here today with an ERP has a leg up because they have this great opportunity to turn some of these things on. So, I gotta be clear, uh, you know, the OWL has a solution that can come forward in terms of BI, but you know, built into Epicor, but based on where you are, your ERP may actually have a lot of what's there. And so if you're a customer, we recommend you speak to Jason Hindle or Darren McPhail, their extensions are on the screen. You should already know them. And uh, it would be Jay Hindle at Success Partners or D McPhail at Success Partners. I could have put that up there, but you should know them. But if you are new to um, ERP and you're looking at ERP as a potential solution, we would be happy to help you. Uh, we would assign an account rep who can discuss whether this makes sense to you or not. But ultimately, this is about a journey. It's a journey of needs, a, a journey of vision, a journey of where you want to take your business to the next step, and it's really about balancing people, process, and technology. So we thank you today for joining us. And we're very interested to see if there's anything we can do for you. Uh, again, it could be right under your nose in terms of capability, or you might be looking for something more advanced. And if you need help developing those processes, this is what 6S Partners and the OWL together do. And we would be happy to bring some of that expertise to the table. So thank you very much, Hugo. I appreciate your time today. And hopefully our clients see some value in this. Hope everyone has a great day out there.